Time for another of our regular sessions with Ron Chamellis, Viewpoint columnist for The Republican and Mass Live. As usual, we touched on a lot of different topics from his recent columns, and we started with the race for the White House. It's like no other campaign that I've been watched, um, and, and I'm not a person that likes to make these broad statements that you know, never happened before, but this is unlike what I've seen before. The country seems to be voting, or at least voicing its opinion, on anxiety to me. And Trump and Sanders, in very different ways, tap into that anxiety. People are nervous about paying for college, about their health care. They're nervous about ISIS. They're nervous about immigration. Uh, and, and there's a lot of anger and resentment in this country. Now, whether that winds up translating into actual votes in the ballot box, we'll see. But the early returns of these two, the caucus and the primary, tell me that don't count either of these people out. Uh, early in the campaign, I think we heard, I heard people say, well, Trump can't win. Sanders can't win. We're hearing less of that now. On the Democratic side, Hillary Clinton, eight years ago when she lost to Barack Obama, closed her campaign off by saying, we've made 18 million, one for each vote she got in the primaries, 18 million cracks in the highest glass ceiling. Everybody thought this is a year she pushes right through that glass ceiling. She's not, and she's not getting the votes of women especially young women. One of her big supporters, another former Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, repeated a remark that she said for years, somewhat in jest at times, but she said that, in her opinion, a special place in hell for women who don't help other women. You wrote about that. That bothered you. It did bother me because if we are going to give equality, and, and I don't blame Hillary Clinton. Sure, she wants a women's vote, and sure she wants to tap into that, but I actually think she's running a campaign based on her merits as she wants to present them. But some of the people supporting her are not helping her. Madeleine Albright is one of them. I thought it was a very offensive statement to younger women as if, you know, get in line, be quiet, get in line, do what you're told. No voter wants to hear that. And I don't think it did Hillary any favors. I think she's had to apologize for statements that she didn't even have to make. You know, it's interesting, and I know you're, you're the dad of a, a young daughter. It seems to me with young women, and I'll say under 30, nobody's ever said to them, you can't be a lawyer. You can't be a doctor. You can't be a senator or president. That just isn't in their mindset. And, and good. That's right. good. But the older feminists, the Madeleine Albrights, the Hillary Clintons, the Gloria Steinems, who opened the door, now kind of can't believe that the younger women aren't ready to get in line. They don't relate to the younger feminism. Uh, I, I'm not sure I'd say that about Hillary Clinton. I'd certainly say it about Gloria Steinem. Her comment uh, to Bill Maher was worse. She said that the only reason women were so, young women were supporting Sanders, they wanted to meet guys. I mean, how can you say that and expect women to respect what you stand for? I, th I think people like Gloria Steinem feel that they've been forgotten in the feminism move and that they're not appreciated. But the issues have changed, as you indicated. This isn't 1975 anymore. It's not 1995 anymore. It's a different type of equality. I still think they face some obstacles, women do, but it's different. And I think the voting population is going to reflect that. I mean, just because you've been told you can be anything, we still haven't seen it happen. No, not to the degree that, that women want. Uh, you know, there are women saying, yeah, we want a woman president, but we don't necessarily say it has to be Hillary Clinton. You know, Carly Fiorina's running for president, too. I don't hear the feminists standing up for her. Well, she was. <laughs> well, she was, okay. Yeah. <laughs> didn't go, it didn't get as far right. as she'd like. Uh, but the issues of feminism have changed, but the old guard of feminism is struggling with that change, I think. Well, it's really an interesting column. You know, we, we keep saying, I keep hearing, and I don't believe it, I don't feel it, that, you know, 60s, the new 40, in the, no, it's not. But you wrote a question, uh, column about the ages. Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, 69, heading towards 70, before one of them would be president. Bernie Sanders will be 75 by Election Day, I believe. You wonder, do we need to talk about and think about the age of people running? And I think it's a fair question. I, I'm not saying don't vote for being, I'm kind of straddling on not this. Not being ageist. Now, I'm not far from those ages, so I have to <laughs> straddle. But, but it's a fair question that I think a lot of people feel embarrassed to bring up now. I, I think you might remember, and I remember, when Ronald Reagan ran for president, mm -hmm. it was a major issue, and that wasn't that long ago. So I think it's a fair issue. It's not the only one, but I think it's worth talking about. And questions were raised. President Reagan, who, who did go into Alzheimer's disease as he aged, there were questions of whether in his last term, perhaps he was already experiencing some of that 
and he would have been in his late 70s. Questions by people who liked him and even members of his family. Mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders will be 75 years old on Election Day. It means he'll be 79 years old by the end of his first term if he wins. That doesn't mean I'm saying he can't do it, mm -hmm. but let's think about that. that. That is a factor. It's at least something to consider in the entire package of, of looking at candidates. Let's go in another direction. Interesting column he wrote, women and the draft. Some top military officers have said we've now opened basically all combat roles to women who want to participate at that level of the military. They should have to now sign up just like any other young person, any man at age 18 for the draft. What do you think? I think if we're serious about equality, which these moving women into combat roles tells me we're looking at total equality or something very, very close, I don't see why they can't sign up for the selective service. That's just a preparation in case there is a draft. Uh, th there's no real commitment to put them into combat by asking them to sign up. By not asking them to sign up, you still have a two-tiered system. I don't, I don't see any reason for that anymore. You wrote a very interesting column. In fact, I, it was one of those ones, you know, you kind of go back and read through it twice to get all the, the inferences and the nuances. Seems I confused you the first time. Well, no, well, <laughs> I, I think it's just me. My, but, but a young woman who was uh, working in the Springfield school system and a piece of videotape from just a couple of years back when she was in college, a college athlete came out and it's pretty horrific stuff. She was saying racist and homophobic remarks uh, was brought to city officials' attention and she was dismissed from a uh, position uh, working with the kids in the Springfield school system. You know, there are those who say, hey, she was punished, she was put off her college team when this happened, time to let her move on with her life. You again said, hard as it may be, this was the right decision to move her out of the schools. Well, it was a decision I defended, yeah. I understand it. I was tortured by writing that, and the only reason I wrote it, I hate mm -hmm. to walk away from the hard ones, and I mm -hmm. thought this was mm -hmm. a really hard one. It is. But I would ask people, there were thousands of people defending her, and I understand why. Would people defend a black person in a reverse role situation? And, and I have to say, I, I doubt if they'd get that level of public support that she did. I don't want to see her life ruined. I don't know the woman, I, I don't. But I do think if we're going to be fair, we have to look at this from both sides of the glass. And in this case, it, it hurt her. I certainly understand why the mayor and the superintendent felt they had to do what they did. Another interesting column in response to uh, reports that had come out regarding conditions, health and safety in some of the area jails, not the Hamden County House Correction, let's point out, but problems in some of the jails. And you were struck not by the report, but by the reaction and the comments people posted, basically saying, eh, too bad if it's uh, not good in jail. What the heck, you didn't you know, go to prior practice to get there. Yeah, they, they, the response, and I knew it was going to happen. I don't always read some of these online comments, especially directed at me. But <laughs> when I do read them, they said, look, they got what they deserve. They, they shouldn't be there. They're the reason they're in jail. Who's going to feel sorry for them? The only problem with that is that there are rules and laws that have to be abided by. And the question with the jails is whether those were not being abided by. You have to follow the law, uh, even if it means cleaning up jails when people say, well, they, they, they are there because of their own doing. Uh, that's a simplistic answer, but it's a common answer people have. And I got to go to a, another area, totally different, but you had interesting comments in a column about decision by uh, WMUA radio at UMass Amherst. You know where I'm going. Cutting back from 12 hours to four hours, their weekend polka music programming. Well, I feel for the Polish community. Uh, I'll tell you what, they still have four hours. It's not like they're getting shut out. There was a severe cutback by the UMass radio station to go to more student-oriented programming. But these people had supported the station, and they were used to their Polish polka programming. And I live in Chicopee. I, I know some of these people. And they were very, very upset. It wasn't a laughing matter to them. Nor should it be. They're proud of their heritage. It's disappointing. I think UMass has the right to do it. But I feel for the people who lost, who lost those shows. Well, Ron Chamel, it's always good to have you in. Always interesting stuff. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you, Jim.